You're listening to Making Conversations Count with me, Wendy Harris, expert telemarketing trainer. Today's guest is the deliciously humble Georgie Vesti, and her show is called Dead Honest. And today we're going to be making conversations about honesty count. What's new, Wendy Woo? Getting social on all of those lovely platforms like Instagram and Facebook and Twitter. It's been great to see our follower count go up. That means that our listener count's going up too. And you're coming back because you're enjoying what you're hearing. So that's brilliant news for us. And of course, we're fast approaching 2022 and I've got some really exciting guests for you. Over on Podchaser, we had a notification from a listener about the Brad Sugars episode. Oh my nosh, Berkshire had this to say. Found this episode really insightful. I even took notes. Learn before you earn. Thank you. Big happy smiley face emoji and four stars. Well, thank you so much for your kind words. And there's definitely lots and lots of gems in there for listeners to take notes. Thank you so much for getting in touch. That's somebody's loved one. So we always treat them as such. I'm Georgie Vesti and this is Dead Honest, a podcast where we talk honestly about death. Now, if there is one death profession I've always been very curious about, it's police divers. I've never understood what would motivate someone to climb into freezing black water to recover the bodies of strangers. Today, we're going to be dead honest. And we're going to be dead honest about podcasting. From a different point of view, two podcast hosts that have been making conversations count about all sorts of topics. But today, the dead honest conversation is going to be with winner of the interview podcast of the year at the British Podcast Awards. It's so lovely to have you here. It's Georgie Bestie. Thank you very much indeed, Wendy, for having me here. Now, we've spoken before, so we must sort of just give people a heads up that we have quite a lot that we agreed about when it comes to podcasting and conversations and all of the stuff that goes on behind the scenes. And we've just had a little moment, haven't we, that we've shared on tech. So it's not just about hitting record and having a conversation and just sending it out there to the big wide world. So we're going to be making conversations about honesty in podcasting count today. What got you into podcasting in the first place, Georgie? Well, it was really what took me into audio and podcasting became an extension of that. I used to do some volunteer work for a coroner in Australia. And I was very fortunate to work with a colleague called John Merrick, who was their sort of lead counsellor who liaised with the families. And I was in his office uh, working as like an assistant to him in a sense. And I heard him have a conversation one day. It was very warm and uh, very conversational and, and quite unlike the sort of conversations we tended to have in the coroner's office. And I thought, oh, it must be a friend of his who's called in. And I remember asking him after he, he got off the phone and there'd been lots of laughter. I said, oh, that sounded like someone who was quite a lot of fun. And he told me the story of who it was. And it was actually the mother of a little girl who'd been murdered. And he shared how they had come together over the death of her daughter and a relationship that at first had been very unsatisfactory because he didn't really understand where his the parents were coming from emotionally. And he had a lot of truth and vulnerability about how he described that relationship and its evolution and how it had turned into this incredible relationship where there was this great laughter going on in the middle of a coroner's office between a bereaved mother and a, a counsellor. And it made me think, gosh, he's so interesting. I would just him retelling the story of this little girl's death, how he approached the parents, how he felt he hadn't succeeded at first and yet continued to persevere and create not only just a great relationship with them, but also a whole organisation to support parents like that. 
And I thought this is a story that never gets told, the, the behind the scenes stories. So that's what really started my interest in thinking, wow, someone should be telling these stories or at least sharing these stories. And so Dead Honest for me is a platform to share the stories of people who basically work behind the front lines of death. So not the paramedics or the doctors or the nurses and so much, the people we don't see and the people doing the work I say that, you know, we hope someone else is doing. I did take a little peek to see the sort of guests that you had on. And it, to me, I was fascinated because you've got divers that are investigators that never really get the limelight of the intricate work that they do. Yet we all love to watch a crime show, don't we? And we'll see them on a boat with a gear on and and yet they're just in, you know, in the far distance. Yet they That's have right. to tell the story for the people that we see on screen that are the stars of the show to be able to solve that crime and investigate that story. So it was a really, really interesting take on that part of our life that's not told. It's not told. And I think one of the reasons it's not told is because the sort of people who go into those professions who are behind the scenes are by definition often quite, they're not seeking the limelight and they're very humble. And the thing that I found really interesting, having interviewed so many different types of death professionals from death doulas to funeral directors, coroner's officers, as you said, police divers, family liaison officers, they have an incredibly high level of job satisfaction. And you'd think that's quite weird because it would look like a very depressing profession to be part of, but actually they're genuinely driven by the desire to help people. And the fact that they help them at the darkest time of their lives is what makes them so extraordinary to me and and why I think they are so deserving of a platform to have that And that's all Dead Honest is. It's just a platform to share those stories. I don't bring anything to it, except I hope I bring a sort of curiosity and a trust that if you're listening to it, you know that I'm going to take you into a pretty dark space, but it's never going to be voyeuristic. I am going to ask the questions that are probably a little bit confronting, but which you probably also wanted to hear. And I think sometimes you're taken into, and I'm sure that you find this too, Wendy, you can ask a really innocuous question and it just takes you down a path that you just don't expect. And yeah, they're the things that, you know, one of the episodes I remember being struck by, you know, when I was asking this chap in episode five, Mo Oliver, who's a fabulous guy, he's a disaster victim identification person. And he had to go to the tsunami in Sri Lanka to help recover the bodies of British nationals who had died there. And I remember saying to him, you know, what was your impressions when you first got to Sri Lanka on that day? And Yes, he talked about leaving the airport and the massive devastation around the coast and what he was seeing. But the thing that really stuck with him was because everything, the infrastructure had been completely blown apart on coastal, you know, the coast of Sri Lanka, he had to stop at one point and he needed to go to the loo. And understandably, it was a very long drive and he jumped out of the the vehicle, went around the back of this sort of rubble and, you know, was going to the loo. And this man came out and he said, what are you doing? And he said, don't you understand? My family are buried underneath that rubble. And he just said, you know, that it's those sort of very small moments that you don't think are going to hit you that hit you. So I think that's also been very interesting for me to share a space with those people where they get to talk about that as well. So, yeah, it's been a hugely rewarding experience to do it. When I ask you which of the cases that have stayed with you, that when you leave this job, you will go back and think, that one will always be with me. Could you describe a case for me? I'm probably known in the office as being in quite control of my emotions, so I can only recall one job where I actually went home and, and sobbed, and that was when I dealt with a friend's wife. But I had no idea at the time when I attended the scene. It was quite a horrific taking of her own life to the point where she was unidentifiable, viewable. It's the fulfilment that you get, isn't it, from from having a conversation that you've got a rough idea, you've got a format, I've got a format. I like to talk about what it is that, that you're doing in your expert field as a guest. 
And then that conversation that counts, I never know what that is. And I never know where that's going to take me. And we've covered subjects like cop death, murder, talking to strangers at the bus stop that then become your best customer. You can't make that kind of thing up and you never know what is going to come next. But it is, it's that space for us to be able to share those stories where others can go, do you know what? That happened to me. Something like that happened to me. I get it. And I think that's what makes for really rewarding listening as well, isn't it? Yeah, I agree with you. It's one of those things that's incredibly misleading about winning that award is that I am so technologically incompetent that when you listen to the finished product, you would be very misled into thinking that I'm very professional. And I think it's one of the things I think is wonderful about getting older and podcasting in middle age is that we can be very transparent about our vulnerabilities. And and then in that, we can be encouraging of other people who also feel they might want to get into the field and think, oh, gosh, I'm never going to sound like that. Well, trust me, I don't sound like that. I, a lot of work goes into sounding like I sound. And I think that's also one of the joys of doing the sort of work that we do, both of us, is that actually, I don't think I could do this if I was any younger. I wouldn't have the experience. I wouldn't have the perspective. I wouldn't have the confidence to be as vulnerable with the conversations that I am. And I think the biggest challenge I find as a podcaster in my middle age is I'm used to being quite competent in the other parts of my life. And I thought, oh, I I shall take on podcasting. And I have been so confounded by how challenging, difficult, not even challenging, difficult I have found the process and how impatient I am with my own ineptitude. I have shown so little kindness to myself. And frankly, I always say I would have fired myself had there been anyone else who could have taken over my role. I'm really trying hard not to laugh so loudly because I know exactly what it is that you're saying there. I've been picking up the phone for over 30 years, having conversations with board level, not giving any kind of thought to the seniority of whoever it is, it, it, you know, I'm just talking to people. We're just connecting. We're, we're having a conversation. We're looking to get stuff done. And I thought it was going to be such an easy transition to just have a conversation on Zoom and, you know, record it. And the learning that has gone into it, spoiler alert, Dr. Ivan Meisner was my best guest. I had to re-record it, even though it said it was recording, it failed And he just said, oh, don't feel bad. That's so funny. Happened to me on Fox News. And the the learning that goes in. The learning, it is that. And and I think we become a bit impatient in middle age with whatever it is that we're doing, whatever profession we're in. And then people say to me, you know, what's your proudest thing about dead honest? And and I say, it's the fact that I actually did it. Because I'm known as a procrastinating perfectionist, which is this really unfortunate affliction. That wonderful Nike ad, you know, just do it. Well, If I could just do it, I would, but I can't because I have to look at it at 360 degree angle. I have to put it through my analytical processing 25 times and then I might be able to do it. And invariably, and it's not funny when it's happening to you, but it is that thing of you just, I have a file on my, my desktop, which is for a parallel podcast called Epic Fail, because I have literally every single interview I have done, I have screwed up, excuse the expression, but I have screwed up one element of it. And like you, the classic where you've got the sound, you've done this, you've got the batteries, you've checked the mic, you've done all of that. Finally, you sit down there and you have a really great interview and then you go look down to press stop. Never pressed record. You know, you just sit there slapping the side of your head. Nobody should have let me out with a recorder. Whose stupid idea was this anyway? So yeah, it's, there's a challenge when we take on new things in midlife, particularly if we do come from places where we feel we've been quite competent. And it can stop us because we just get impatient with ourselves and think, well, obviously I can't do this. I think that's the thing that I'm proudest of with Dead Honest in a way is I actually kept going. And, you know, that was important. It's been going for a number of years, hasn't it, Georgie? It's- <laughs> No need to rub it in how long it took me to get here. Thanks, Wendy. We we do joke that actually climate change will be solved before I actually produce my next series. But yes, it has. And and I think it's also I do other stuff as well. So it's not something I can give all of my time to, nor do I think it's something, and I don't know if you find this, that actually 
when I'm doing a creative project, I find it helps to have something else to do, to sort of have in parallel so that I can rest my brain a bit and come back to it fresh. I find I'm often my least productive when I devote myself to something full on, be that motherhood, creative task, you know, job or whatever. I, I have to strike that balance between different things to take myself off and refresh myself. It's for me, I find podcasting highly addictive, the conversations and what comes out of it. But the other side to the technological challenges and the learning that you have to do and the support that you have to sort of call upon. Thank you, Neil. Is the expectations of the episode. You know, in my mind, sometimes I'll go, do you know, that was just a fantastic interview and I loved it and everybody's going to love it too. And then they don't. And then the episode that you go, well, yeah, no, that was okay. That was interesting. It's still, you know, got value. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to roll with it anyway. And people love it and it surprises you. I think, you know, it's that kind of grounding that we're not the judge of what's good or great. The listeners are. That's so true. In some episodes, as you say, I've been absolutely, you know, I think they're fantastic episodes because they've spoken to something within me, but they may not have dealt or spoken to something more widely. And as you say, we just can't make that judgment ahead of time. We just can put it out there and hope that it finds an audience. And I think that's one of the reasons why I love podcasting over conventional audio is A, I can ask questions which I wouldn't be allowed to on the radio. I can be more explicit, more graphic, but also I can then reach people across. I mean, nothing's more exciting than looking at the fact that you've got listeners in Africa or you've got listeners, you know, suddenly it's gone big in Canada and you just think, God, that's what I love. It's like reaching your tribe, which for me is a very important part of why I do this. And I love that side of podcasting. And I also love the fact that we're independent. I don't know about you. I imagine we're quite autonomous beings. We don't like being bossed around and told what we can do. <laughs> Definitely not. <laughs> and it gets worse as you get older, I hate to tell you. <laughs> um, but equally, that's quite liberating because it is relatively low budget tech wise. So pretty much anyone, it's very democratic in that sense, which I love. And it also allows me to do it in the way that I would like to do it. And I wouldn't be bothered to do it if I wasn't being told to do it in a different way. I don't know how you'd feel with your podcast, but that feels quite strongly to me. I feel quite strong about that. Confession, it's only recently that I've started to listen to other podcasts. It was maybe episode 30 something before I thought, oh, I wonder how they do it. And on reflection, whilst it was a shock to quite a few people, especially my producer said, oh, you know, so-and-so is podcast. And I was like, mm, I've heard of it, not listened to it. And it was because for me, I wanted to create my show. This is how I want it to be. If I start listening to lots of other formats and styles, my own style and format would just be chopping and changing, chopping and changing because I'd be trying to find, I'd be trying to get back to who I am. So I decided that I was going to get into an absolute rhythm of what I wanted it to be before I could allow myself to go and listen and be a listener and not be judging as a show. I think what's wonderful about that is the fact that it's about authenticity. And I think there is, as podcasting has become so incredibly crowded as a market, I find it harder and harder to find things to listen to. What I'm always interested in listening to are people like us, what I call the sort of boutique backstreet podcasts, where you can feel the person who makes it in the voice of the person, you know, speaking and also in the choice of, you know, mannerisms that they have, you come to learn and, and, and like about them. It, I think that is one of the things that's the key to a successful podcast now, particularly as independent producers, if you've not got a big backer like a Spotify or, or, or Audible or whatever, is keep to yourself. And I think that's really important because that is your uniqueness is probably the only thing that's going to punch through the number of like there are over two million podcasts now that are going to punch through at any level. And that's why I think it's really important when we do these sort of podcasting courses and whatever is that people don't lose sight of their own, what they themselves bring, because guaranteed that's actually what your audience are looking for as well. So there's no point in me starting to sound like a Radio 4 presenter or whatever, 
And that's very easy to start doing that because we're brought up with those voices in our head and the way of presenting and whatever. You have to exorcise that and keep very true, I think, to who you are. And and that's true for any creative endeavor or indeed any business endeavor that you feel you author that is your own. It's got to stay very grounded in who you are and what you then bring into the market. And that's what listeners are looking for, isn't it? Is that ability to tune in to what is being foretold. Yeah. And hearing, I think people are really interested to hear vulnerability and maybe that's a, that's a post COVID thing and whatever, but I think when podcasts are relatable and you think, you know, you can hear sometimes when I ask a question, I'm nervous because I'm actually possibly straying over a line, which might get a snap back. And I think that's what takes your listeners with you is when they hear your openness to being vulnerable and relatable, that's what draws them in. It's not about the downloads. It's the quality of the audience that you've got, not the quantity of the audience that you've got. At least it is for me. Yes. Um, probably because I don't have a very big audience. <laughs> but I mean, you know, that's much more relevant and, and important to me because those relationships, the authentic relationships are important to me. With the relationship with listeners, it kind of brings us on to that point of the conversation that counted for you really in terms of the pivotal moment. What was it that happened to you, Georgie, that you've not told me about already? I think it was bearing witness in a sense, being in a position where I've been very privileged to work inside coroner's offices. So I've been very privilege to seeing people where there's no bullshit. On the worst day of your life, you are who you are. And I think seeing John and hearing John talk about his own vulnerability in approaching that relationship and exposing his, I hate that word, journey, but his journey from being a not terribly effective person to becoming a really valued person, it was part of his that story that also interested me, that hearing his, exposing his own vulnerability. And I've heard some really extraordinary stories from people where they've been incredibly generous to open up to that. Now, why does that speak in particular to me? I'm not entirely sure, but I do tend to find the other organisations I work with, one is supporting families whose relatives have been murdered abroad, and another organisation that supports the greater scrutiny of stillbirth investigations by coroners. And there is something that meets my need to be in an authentic place when I'm actually emotionally in an authentic place with those people. The thing that really doesn't work for me is being in a wildly social situation where I can't actually have what I would call a proper conversation. And most people would probably think, oh my God, she sounds so intense. But actually that's where I function at my best. I like myself best at that level and I like meeting people at that level. So I think that's What sort of drew me into that and just thinking, actually, I don't think I'm alone on this one. And fortunately, it's proved that I'm not. Other people are generally drawn into that as well. It's the taking it back to what we wanted to talk about today in terms of making those conversations about honesty count, isn't it? That there is no room to be anything but honest. You don't have the time to disguise the masks are thrown away, aren't they, if anything, because you can only bear so much in those situations. So I think you really connect with true self. I do. And I think maybe also having, I did a blog on my website about being brought up in the country as a kid, because people often say to me, how did you get so comfortable with death? And I think there's something about a country childhood where you are exposed. I was brought up in Australia and, and, and where you are exposed to pretty basic life and death every day, whether it's things flooding and you end up walking down a riverbank and seeing a cow strung up in a tree, or there's a dead kangaroo on the way into school, which your mum has to drag off the road. Or So you're much more confronted with life and death. I didn't feel a repulsion around that. It felt the normal. It was quite a normalised thing I was brought up with. So Yeah. And it's one of those things that, you know, it can either make people, you know, run a million miles. You know, I mean, it's always that terrible thing. People say, oh, you run a podcast. You have a podcast. Oh, how lovely. What's your podcast about? I'm like, "Uh, it's about the people who help us when we die and when we're dead. 
And it's like, oh. <laughs> and I have to apologize. Like, I, I, I can't make it sound any better than that. I'm really sorry, but because that's what it's about. And it actually is quite a good way of filtering. It's self-selective. The people who want to hear it, genuinely the sort of my sort of people, and we can have a great connection because of it. It is really interesting and it's hit up on my playlist for those moments when I will go. I'm going to listen today and be a listener. Georgie, I really, really thoroughly enjoy your honesty about podcasting and your show. And I think that for anybody that's thinking about podcasting or that is podcasting and is wondering why they're podcasting, just remember why you started it or why you want to start it in the first place. That is such good advice, Wendy, because I think it's, you know, I find if I was doing a talk this weekend for the podcasting festival, and I think there are two things that people really need to ask themselves. Podcasting is really hard. It looks easy to do, but actually to sustain it is really hard, or I certainly found it hard. I find it hard to keep it going in terms of ideas and delivery and, and all the rest of it. The other thing I think is really important and has helped me hugely to deliver dead honest at, at the level that it is, is I have this fantastic friend who is also a podcaster. We talk about mentors and often mentors we think have to be much bigger than us. But actually, I think the most useful mentors are people who are just maybe one step ahead of you and who have got the time and the compassion to believe in you when you don't believe in yourself. And I know for me personally, I have a, a, another podcast friend called Natasha Miller. And between us, we meet online every week on a Thursday. And we support each other. We listen to each other's work. And when we're feeling really rubbish and, and like the whole world's crap and we're sh- what are we doing? We should throw our recorders out the window. The other person will pick up and support you. So I'd also be, I'm a big advocate of what I call micro mentors and help they helping, you know, particularly as an independent, using them to help you deliver on the process. Support and grow. Really important. Very important indeed. <laughs> If you have somebody or you have a story that you'd like to share, do get in touch with me and the team here at Making Conversations Count. We love to give a shout out to everybody. But let's carry on the conversation next week where we're going to be getting savvy with a dynamic duo that are AA rated. We've got Anna and Anita of Get Savvy joining us next week. And you won't know about it. No one's going to say, well, I was going to book you as my next confidence coach, for example, but I'm not now. (laughs) 